student on 2056 for two years. I was an electronics lead. Then I mentored for a year. Then I switched over to 1285 and 1241 for the past two years. Um, another reason that I would seem qualified in electronics was I used to be a CSA uh, for FRC. I used to be a robot inspector where I saw daily wiring and noticed mistakes that teams can do through uh, making a robot and referees where you see batteries falling out the robot where you never want to see that. <laughs> or even buffers falling off. Um, robots, to make a robot run smoothly, you need a cohesive system where it's integrated, clean, neat. Uh, you know where all the wires are going. You don't have to trace it from the motor to the motor controller or the PDB. You kind of know where the wire is going already. Uh, today I'll be talking about components, layout, sensors, and maybe doing a hands-on session if we have time. I actually forgot to start. Uh, so there are a few main components I'll be going through. Uh, just the basic overlay for anyone who's actually new to wiring. Um, there's a PDP, which is called a power distribution panel, or a power distribution board, whichever word you choose to choose. Um, it basically gives power or controls power to all the main components like the other components I'll mention, but basically power to the brain of the robot, which is the robo reel, and all of your motor controllers and motors. Um, one thing that I, I, when I was on 2056 we used to do was label all of our ports right up here to show which port is for which motor so you don't have to memorize it or have an electrical diagram every time you want to know where wire is coming from or going to. Um, this is a voltage regulator module. Um, this basically gives power, it controls power, uh, it regulates the voltage, uh, it's connected to the PDP and the radio through uh, PoE, uh, power over ethernet. Uh, the rubber reel, the brain of the robot. Uh, there are analog connections and PWM connections. Uh, now it's more, we kind of use uh, can wiring through uh, talons and vectors, but if you do use uh, the spark motor controllers or any of the older talons or vectors, uh, you use PWM connections through there, and that allows you to know where your robot is or where your elevator is or where your arm is in relative to where it's positioned on the robot. So you know if you've driven two meters forward or if your elevator's gone a feet above or two feet higher, it's actually at the lowest level possible. Um, this also allows you to deploy code for autonomous to directly to the rover wheel where it stores it. Uh, there's connections to the RSL uh, that's through here, and CAN, which is over here. Uh, CAN is another system to interconnect everything. Uh, it connects all your motors, if you have newer motor controls. If you have older ones, you connect them through PWM, or you don't connect them at all. You kind of connect it through uh, the motors and the motor controller. Uh, but CAN, it, it's a tricky system because there's such thin wires. There, one solution that I've come up with is using um, solder to solder the wires individually together so they don't come off. Uh, there's another tool, I don't know what it's called actually. Furrow. Sorry? A furrow crimp. Uh, we use, I don't like those ones because the wire is so thin they come out really easily. There's another thing that 610 uses, uh, I don't remember what it's called. Pinch locks. 
Yeah, I think I think that's what they are. But it, so it allows you have to make sure you are actually putting it in properly. You just don't shove it in. You want the metal to touch the actual wires, not the insulate insulation. Um, uh, these are these are all the newer motor controllers. The older ones, I forgot to put them on. Um, the one on the top is the Victor. The one on the bottom left is the Talon, and the one on the right is the Spark uh, motor controller. These help you, uh, like I said before, control your robot to know where your motor is, especially when you have sensors, or to allow you to figure out what position you are on the field or where your elevator is in relation to the ground and your height. Uh, the PCM. This is only if you have pneumatics. Now, pneumatics is a, also another tricky system where you have to uh, have a pneumatics control, or a pneumatic, I forget what it's called now. Uh, valve bank, yeah. You have to have a valve bank <coughs> to let uh, in the solenoids which connect into the PCM those PCM, when they're connected in the PCM, then you can give signals to the solenoid to give air to an individual piston or um, any other solenoid you have. Um, the PCM also controls when your um, compressor can restart and uh, re start filling air back in if you start to lose some or use it, not lose, lose is a bad thing. <laughs> um, this is two diagrams that I always like to have when doing PCM wiring. Um, the one on the top left is everything other than the PCM and the solenoid. It's to show you where the pressure switch, the gauge, both gauges, and your compressor and your storage tank should be in relation so you know proper way for the wires to go. Um, this diagram on the bottom corner, it has uh, labeling, so you can, it kind of includes that one, but it's a bit separate. So it shows you where each wire should go. Uh, you, if you also notice, there's yellow can wires. So these can wires connect from the PCM to your PDP, to your robo reel, and then through all your motor controllers. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, you can always raise your hand. I'll answer them. Mm -hmm. uh, radio, most important thing. I would please beg you, please use your PoE, uh, Power Over Ethernet. It comes in your kit of parts. Uh, it's an orange cable on the top left corner. Um, it, the basic function of it is to less, <coughs> lessen the wire, if that's a word, lessen the wires used to connect your robo reel, your radio, and your voltage regulator module. Um, it also opens up sport opens up <coughs> ports on your radio, so when you want to directly connect your radio, uh, you have two ports instead of just one, if one of them is broken. Uh, I posted this diagram to show, uh, this is a, I, I don't know if anyone's noticed this ever, but there's slots at the bottom of your radio. The slots in the bottom of your radio can fit a bolt in it, and it's like if you ever have those chains that lock your door, it goes in one and then slides, it's the same thing over here, there's a big hole and a small hole, so you can lock it in. And then you put Velcro underneath, so when it's locked onto the bolt, you can slide it down, put it onto the Velcro, and then your radio will never come off or come loose. The Velcro also absorbs shocks that you get from heat vents or hitting anything. So it allows your radio to always be secure, it never kind of gets loose or it gets unplugged from your PoE. Another reason to use PoE is uh, it doesn't have the black cable that goes into your power, and that's very loose. Ethernet has a more secure connection than that um, power cable that just slides in and has no block. Uh, these are two sensors that weren't on my next slides. Uh, this is in the VEX Pro on the VEX Pro website. Uh, it's a it's an encoder that's already, it can fit inside your motor. You don't have to put it on the outside. Uh, it's called the VersaPlanetary Versa Planetary in Integrated Mode Encoder. And the one on the left is a mag encoder. It's more high-tech than the regular encoders to 
uh, allow your drive gearboxes or your elevator gearboxes or your pivot gearboxes for your intakes that kind of fling out. Um, yeah, I highly recommend using encoders, but you also need to know how to do it with programming, which I am not an expert in, so I, I do know the importance of programming, but I, I, I don't know anything about that, but they do really appreciate it. Uh, these are, this is another one of three encoders. So the mag encoder is for continuous circular movement. Uh, the potentiometer is for a sync, not a single movement, but less than 360, or up to 360 degrees. So you can't go past that 360. Um, so it, it's more precise um, uh, measurements to know where, so in 2015, you probably, none of you were probably back there, but in 2015, there were arms that we had to kind of, from a stand up position and fling them out really, really fast in less than a second to grab onto cans. And these potentiometers help that precision uh, driving of those motors so they go really fast and slow down just at the precise moment so they don't bounce back off. Um, so, so were you hooking those potentiometers, uh, because of course it's a natural rotary potentiometer, were you then hooking them right onto the central pivot or were you um, going between a, a pinion and a drive gear just so that I, I really think, I, I don't know, this is four years ago, yeah. and I wasn't the design person for this, but I think it was directly on it, or Just directly right on, on it, yeah. The, the I don't remember. Uh, the robot in the cafeteria um, that's near the coffee machine, yeah. that one has it. I don't remember if we still have it on there, but you, uh, if you, you also go to Ty's workshop, uh, yeah. uh, Tyler, uh, he can also tell you about that. Uh, or you can, we can go after this to that room if you really want to know about that. Yeah. Um, I don't remember if it was on it or on the computer. That's a very, it's just for anyone else, uh, that's a very similar setup to the uh, fuel gauge in your car. It's from an automotive standpoint, uh, the float that's in your fuel tank uh, is on a small arm and then there's a half moon potentiometer uh, that goes down with two contact arms. So as your, as your fuel is being used and all that, um, they used to do, use a zero to 90 ohm range in the older cars, so it wasn't very accurate. But now the cars that have uh, computers that will tell you exactly how far you can go to your, your fill up and stuff, uh, they have a zero to 250 ohm resistor in there, so they're a little bit more accurate and you get a lot less um, of those phantom sweeps when you're turning a corner or whatever and the fuel gauge goes up and down and stuff. So that's where it's, it's a hard number. Um, this is the older version of the encoder. Um, yeah, I, I always use mag encoders, so I can't really tell you why we, I ever, we ever use these. Um, but the same point as before, they help you measure continuous movement, so it's useful when you're driving, when you put it on your drive gear box, because it will tell you how far you've gone or how far you need to, it'll help you tell the robot how far to go. Um, it used a light source, so it kind of and <coughs> how far you went. The mag encoder is more precise, where it's a magnetic connection instead of just a light sensing where it is going or how much it's turned. Um, the accelerometer that's already built into the robo reel, so you kind of don't need to buy the sensor, but if you understand it, you can use it properly to figure out how far or how fast you can accelerate your robot or how fast you want to. Uh, gyro. This is probably the most important one. It helps you have a relative. So the fields are usually 54 by 27 in length, or 54 in length and 27 in width. And it helps you figure out where your robot is exactly. This year, this thing, this uh, sensor is very useful in the respect that when you jump off a platform, that it's hard to, it, it allowed you to figure out where you were and turn yourself back into orientation because when you're jumping off a platform, you never know where you're gonna land and you're gonna land straight. Mm -hmm. So this allowed, hey, that's my seat. Uh, this allowed you to keep your robot in the place you exactly wanted. Uh, switches. This is 
very useful if you want to use basic or simple technology where you have, um, uh, it allows you to figure out if you have the robot in contact or, or sorry, if you have a game piece in your possession or if you don't have it in possession. Um, so as soon as the sensor is pushed down or if you have a, I forget, I think it's a limit switch, the other one. If you have either of them contacted, you know if you have the game piece. Uh, this year, it's very useful to know. Uh, there's also another version of this where it's a distance sensor, so it can tell you if you had the ball or not this year. Uh, most, I hope most of you know this year's game. If I'm referencing it, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay, so this what, what is... What would you say would be one of the weaknesses of using mechanical switches, though? Like, uh, you could have a false positive, or if a ball comes in, touches it, and then slides back out, and you think you have the ball, or the... Yeah, it's more the false positive that how you don't know if it's always accurate. It's it's easier, it's more reliable to use it on human um, knowledge that you know if you had a game piece, but like this year, if you were, this year is not actually a good example, uh, in 2017, if you had to go get um, balls or, um, what do you call it? No, um, the gear. Yeah. If you had to get the gear, it's really far and there's a big object right in front of you, so to instead of tell one of your human players to give you a thumbs up or you to see if the gear actually went in or if you're not positioned right, then when that touch sensor goes there, it can tell you when the gear is in or if you're in the right position for that gear. Um, yeah, it, it's more when you can't see things, it's easier to figure out if you have them. So if you've got the ball, then you can have some, there's a couple of robots I've seen that have LED lights that light up so you can see when you have it, or it can be on your uh, dashboard or on your computer. It can just have a big green light that pops up when it says you have the game. Uh, there's also, uh, 610 does this, where they, as soon as they have a game piece, the touch sensor is uh, contacted, and then they have an automated system where they can grab the rest of it and everything folds up or extends out and <coughs> release it or uh, drive away. I think that some of the teams were trying with the, because of the Xbox controller, the benefit of having uh, the internal vibrator feature yeah. turn on, that when you had the game piece, the controller would yeah. uh, so set you it can grab away easier yeah. than knowing if you had the game piece or not. This is a very, uh, yes, yes. Just a quick question. Will we, we be able to access these, your PowerPoint? I will post, this I will give it to our lead, our 2056's lead mentor. He will post yeah. it online. Okay. I also have an email at the very end. Um, you can send me an email if he doesn't post it as soon as he can, and then I can send you the PDF version of this file. Um, so this is a very logical thing. Uh, this You can't always have your robot designed like this with your layout like this, but um, This is always good to have as like a backup or as a plan so you know what motor is going so you can have a setup uh, when you're beginning to wire your robot. Um, yeah, I don't really know why else you would have ever have this. So you can't design your robot <coughs> on this map. You actually have to plan it out depending on your dimensions. There are a couple photos I'll show about that. Um, So uh, the main thing about wiring is you always should plan. Um, also, never build up your robot structurally fully and then decide, okay, now we can wire it. Try to wire it when you have your drive base made, then you can start putting basic stuff in. When you have motors that go up or somewhere else on the robot that are not on the <laughs> drive frame, those you can put in. <coughs> if you have the uh, the PDP, the PCM, the RoboRio, the VRM, the radio, uh, and a lot of motor controllers on the base of the robot wired in with lots of space and those little tiny wires properly fitted in, then you can have a more secure connection and then you can build the rest of your robot. So you can also make it neat. So you don't have to put your hand in through a little hole just to put a wire in and then 
realize that oh, in competition, it's really hard to get that wiring or out again. Yes. Do you recommend having the main electrical components on the base of the robot? Or like last year, we had them on our vertically on ours. So, like, what are the pros and cons? Like? So the pros of having it on the base of your robot are that it helps your center of gravity. I get that electrical components don't weigh as much, but it also helps you keep it uh, safe and secure from other robots potentially reaching onto the side of your robot and ripping an electrical connection off. Um, I, I'm not saying that you have to have it on the base of the robot. In 2016, 2056, had a robot where the ball funneled through right through the middle of the robot and came out the top. Now, if you have a ball uh, about 12 inches wide going right through the middle of your robot, you don't have space for electrical. So what we did was put the electrical on the sides. So now the ball would have this much clearance from our PDP or battery. Now, it, that's very close, but you can design for that. Now, when we wanted to get uh, when we wanted to get into wire to see where they were going, it was really easy because it was on the base of the robot, everything was neat. The reason I don't like having, this is my personal opinion, having electrical things on the underside uh, or on the side is you can never see them really. If you have them on the top, you can see them very easily, especially CSAs or FTAs, they can help you out and see if you have electrical connections. But if you plan your robot properly from the beginning, and always have secure connections, you don't have to worry about an FTA seeing if you have connection or not. The reason I don't like putting it up there is other robots can grab on, and if they, even someone throws a ball or a cube at you, then if one wire comes out, you're, it's pretty much being dead. It could be any wire. I've seen robots been, their um, uh, main breaker, it was somewhere on the robot, quite hidden. Someone reached in, pressed the, uh, button and they turned off the robot. Now it was a secure place, but if you have it in an open place, that's a much easier target for any robot to touch it. But if you have a Lexan piece on top of it, that's also an easier way to, what do you call it, secure your um, uh, components. I, I just like it on the base because it, it helps your center of gravity and it, it just prevents any possibility of someone grabbing onto a wire. Uh, my team did it this year, we, were, we put it on the side, so I, I can't say that you should never do it, but depending on your design, if you can see. Okay. Um, yeah. Because of uh, so many of the standard uh, anti-mark bases being drop center, um, location of your battery is really important as to whether or not you have mechanisms on the front that are going to cause the majority of the traction through your front wheels, <coughs> as opposed to on the back if you want them the majority of your traction to stay on the front wheels. You want to try and position your battery up at the front as well as your other mechanisms or try and counteract and balance out that weight. So battery positioning is, is pretty important as well as what you probably be saying, I don't, know, I don't want to take away your slides, but changing a battery. Yeah, is, it, changing a battery, you want it easy, but I, I've, had, I've been on 2056 where we've had to put it from the underside, lift up the entire robot. 120 robot and then put the battery in with the velcro like if you're sliding a battery on velcro you can't really slide it you have to lift it up and put it on top another reason that i don't like it high up is you have longer wires the longer your wire the more easy it is for a cut to happen somewhere where you don't expect it and then it's harder to trace your wires now if you want a replacement of that entire wire you have to make sure that you have that long extension another reason that uh, another good thing in wiring is that you always want to plan ahead just in case you have to replace an entire system. I've had on 2056 where if we want to replace our entire shooter, we have disconnect for all the motors and we take out the entire shooter and put a new one in with new electrical connections, new motors, new slides, new shooter wheels, everything. That's easier than uh, crimping, <coughs> starting stripping more wire and then putting another connection on and then you have to cut the old wires, instead you can take out a whole system, put a new one in, and this is helpful in finals, semi-finals, quarter-final matches, or especially in districts where matches are literally three matches next year, the next one after you just played one. So it, 
planning for that respect is also a good thing. Um, it's not just about planning and setting up your entire electric system once. You have to plan to uh, maintain it. If you have to replace anything, have things ready. Um, if you have a 30 pound weight limit where if you can put some wires into it that are already <coughs> pre-made, that are just attached to your motor. You don't have to put whole assemblies in, but if you have motors that are soldered or electrically cr uh, crimped and everything, that helps you uh, sub out motors if they're burnt or anything, or even uh, motor controllers. Uh, considerations for all of these components, these are your, most of your main ones. Uh, your main circuit breaker, try to keep it visible. Um, easy, also accessible if you want to turn off your robot very easily, uh, so you can press the power button. Um, your battery, like he said, you want to help your center of gravity since it's a really heavy battery. Keep it uh, near the center of your robot or the front or back, depending on if you have heavier mechanisms up high. Um, and also keep it well secured with Velcro or with uh, clip uh, fasteners. Um, speed controllers, uh, there's a diagram up ahead where they keep it really close to the PDP. It's just a smaller, uh, create less amounts of wire. Wire also adds up to weight. It may be a little bit, but it also adds up. Um, and keep your radio and your main breaker protected. Um, these are general guidelines. These are also on the first website um, about what minimum size wire should be on each of your uh, components. Um, for your battery, it should always be six gauge. There's teams that use four gauge too. Um, for your radio and your DRM connections, uh, there's 20 gauge. Um, any of your, if you put the, there's a bigger side to your PDP and a smaller side, all of those wires should all be 12 gauge or higher. 12 gauge is pretty easy to fit in other than 10 or 8. Um, 14 is too small, it's, it's harder on the motor or the speed controller. Um, 18 is for the really small gauges or small ports on your PDP. Um, uh, PWMs, it depends uh, what you decide if you want because most of the motor controllers now don't have PWM, so it depends what you want, but it's better to buy the PWM connection to make it. Um, and can. Uh, that is very small, I think it's 24 gauge. The reason it's, because it's so small, it's best not to put it into uh, fer it's not, best not to put it into ferrules because it comes out of the ferrules very easily. Um, yeah, so if you notice here, all the speed controllers are right beside the PDP, and you can see where each wire is going to each uh, motor controller. On the top, this is a real <coughs> robot, but you can see all the PCM connections, uh, all the solenoid, all the PWM connections are all wired, zip tied, and very neat. You can see where they're all going. Um, color coding is very helpful. If you have two black wires and you're trying to figure out which one's black and which one's red, just don't use the two black wires. Just try to figure out find red or black. Um, green and white are yeah the other ones. Um, your CAN connections are yellow and green. Um, yeah. Question came up in our group that one of the students was asking why are the CAN wires twisted? Uh, the CAN wires, I don't know why they come twisted, but I it's, think it's just... Uh, when you twist them, it doesn't mean you have twisted pair on network cables. If you have interference, it cancels out. Uh, so they come twisted, it's better to keep them twisted so they kind of stay neat. It also they're very visible when they're connected or twisted into a, a bind like that. Um, so they're very, uh, these are called zip tie anchors, what I've called them. I don't know what, I couldn't find them online. These are very helpful when you put them on the base of your robot or any protrusions or any bars or anything to keep your zip ties attached to that. Um, before you put the zip tie anchor, clean it with alcohol, uh, metal, really sucks for that, so clean it with alcohol, and use lots of zip ties. Um, I, I've used 
around 10 zip ties just to connect one motor controller to one uh, motor and connect, or keeping that wire stuck to the base or to any uh, frame. So zip ties really help. It keeps your wiring secure and you know where your wires keep going. Yeah. One thing that if you have enough different colors of zip ties, you can have every zip tie in the chain the same color. If you have two connectors and you're not sure where they go, if they have matching zip tie colors, they go together. Yeah, that, never done that, but yeah, that also helps. Uh, so the, any of your motors, um, you always want to use Anderson connectors. These ones are used on any of your 775 Pros. Um, I don't like these. They come off very easily. I always solder them, um, but soldering is also very tricky. So it depends on your resources too and your skill. Um, that is the inside of one of these Anderson connectors. If you notice, there's a particularly way to uh, put the clip into the Anderson. Uh, you have to teach your students or you have to teach your friends how to do this properly. Um, but also notice, maybe this one's not the greatest example, but you see very little wire uh, between the the cover of the wire and the actual print. Uh, that's the, the best one when you don't see any wire, but that's also, also hard. Uh, so you want to strip just enough or kind of measure how long your crimp is, and then you can measure how long you should strip so you know how much wires can be properly put in without exposing enough wire. If there is one wire coming out, you have to read, you don't have to, but it's best to redo it. I have gone lazy where I've just got snips and cut them, but it's better to actually do it properly. Um, so, so like he said, you can put different zip tie colors to put uh, label all your wires. Um, at least 2056 does this, where they put labels on the wires, on the PDP, on the motor, on the motor <coughs> controller, um, like five different other places on the wires. So it can, and it doesn't have to be like the full description of the entire motor, it can just be uh, DF1, so drive front one motor. And then there, there's three motors, so you do DF2, DF3. Uh, and then you can do elevator, so E, L, V, or just E1. It depends on how you remember your naming convention. Uh, electrical tools. Uh, the different color and slides was, it was just too messy. Um, different ones that I recommend buying. These are battery crimps. They can also be your Anderson crimps. Uh, these are wire cutters. Uh, this is a Wago tool. This is best used for the PDP wire connections. Um, some people put straight wire into the PDP. I would put these big ferrules, crimp them on first. Uh, the ferrule tool is on the next page. But crimp these ferrules on first then put it into PDP. You don't have to worry about stray wires or anything, and it, it goes cleanly inside. But this tool is used to prop it open. A flat screwdriver also works, but it can be very hard. Um, also, remember that where you put your PDP, you might need space to remove the wire if it's not properly put in. So uh, make sure you know where you're putting your wires, um, or where you're putting your PDP. Um, so with your uh, wire cutters on the last page, um, one of the things that we had to really make sure of is that the electrical tools do not get crossed over with anyone else. If, if a student believes that that looks like a great pair of uh, uh, wire or cutters to cut a cotter pin or something like that, um, once it's used through the flush mounted wire cutters, they're pretty much done. Yeah, I haven't noticed that ever yet, but uh, uh, most of the other tools you can't really exchange with anyone else uh, one sec yeah. uh, but the wire I, I get where you're coming from that but I haven't really had a problem with that I, I just asked for people for wire cutters and I get anyone and I make them work there are some terrible ones I do admit that but yeah uh, you had a question where do you buy the ferrules uh, so there are a bunch of websites at the very end um, one website uh, I've actually gone to a local electrical store and bought them those are cheaper than the ones online but um, Vex Pro uh, CTRE Electronics 
Um, Amazon even has them. This is how it sells the ferals uh, fairly economically, but you don't want to cheap out on the crimp. Sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry, Princess, Princess Auto sells the ferals as well, but you don't don't cheap out on the crimper. Um, that's that's the one thing. These are the best crimpers yeah. that I've found. I've used those on yeah. 20, 50, 60, and 1241. Yeah. Um, do those clips up there, these are retention clips. These are best to use to uh, keep your Anderson connectors together. Um, there are three different types of crimps for Anderson. This is for 12 gauge wire, this is for 14 gauge wire, and 18 gauge wire. Um, these ones are harder to see, but uh, they're, they're, they're the right crimps for the right wires. You can use these, but I, I'd recommend these two. Um, and these are your battery crimps. Uh, there are a special type of lugs for it. Uh, you need to buy these, and these ones are for six gauge wire. Um, these are, okay, so these are your Anderson crimps. These are the cheaper ones. There are more expensive ones. They're like $250. These ones are like $40, $50. And there's a color coding on it. You can't really see it right now, but there's a yellow for, I don't even remember what the colors are now. There's a yellow, blue, and a red sticker, and it's, one for 12 gauge, one for 14 gauge, one for 18 gauge. So it, it helps you so you don't have to remember. Uh, yeah, I'm almost done. These are the last two slides. I will post these. Uh, if you want to ask me my email, you can do that. But um, Vex Pro, CTRE Electronics, Andy Mark, uh, Studica is the Canadian version of Andy Mark. Uh, McMaster Car, this is more industrial stuff, but there are some electrical stuff on it for sure. Um, these, this link is more um, controls and uh, software and stuff, or how to figure out how your electronics work. And this is more resources on it, software resources and electrical. Uh, these are, the first ones are websites to buy stuff off of, these ones are resources to figure out uh, how things work or how if you want to learn anything. And my last slide, is uh, about 10 to 15 <coughs> teams that are notably well in the community where you can find resources, not just electrical, mechanical, wiring, software, CAD, uh, how to run a team. Um, I'm sure you know the Robo Wranglers, the Neutron, Compass Alliance is a combination of alliances or teams. Um, 33, Strike Force, Obviously, cheesy booths. Uh, Symbiotics has a lot of ones. They even have a SolidWorks teaching uh, course there. Uh, 971 just recently posted their 2019 uh, uh, Spartan series, and the Citrus Circuits have a variety of ones. Uh, that's my email, and thank you. Um, you were saying that soldering uh, does lend itself a little bit of challenges since obviously uh, we are to be using lead-free solder. Um, there is uh, lead-free solder uh, flux that does and will help out an awful lot with soldering, uh, making sure that uh, you properly tin the tip. Uh, so if you're using an old uh, lead soldering gun, it's a good idea to change the tip over so you'll get the contamination that makes it difficult. Oh, and uh, Automation Direct is another one that you can get the uh, furrow crimper on, and you can actually use your uh, uh, you can use uh, part of your uh, credit on your first um, for your first selection if you're going to buy that tool. So the Automation Direct company has a number of the tools as well now. The second to last. First four websites actually, or first, yeah, first five maybe. They have all the electrical tools that I mentioned. Every single one of them. Um, the the crimp on the bottom corner, bottom right corner, and um, these wire strippers, and uh, the 
print on the top left are, if you see the watermark, it's by PowerX. Those are the cheaper ones. There's a more expensive one. Um, but PowerX is the cheapest crimps out of the crimps that are available for our resources. Um, those, yeah, they work really well. Um, there are $250 ones if you want to make an investment. 2056 has, but that, yeah, I envy, envy that. I don't have that anymore. Yeah. The $50 or the $250? The investment of that. The $250? Um, the, so there's a little block. There's a little block at the back that allows you to, it's a backstop. So when you put the entire crimp inside, it kind of stops. With the $50 ones, you have to kind of hold it. And there's very precarious, precarious positions in holding it. It can be worth it, but if you, if you practice enough, you can work with the fifty dollar ones. Any other questions? Uh, oh, a multimeter, uh, a heat gun. Those are also very good. Uh, sorry. So there's a Power X, which is for the battery lugs. Um, the Tri Crimp, uh, T R I Crimp, at the very top. That's for the um, the three individual ones for the 12, 14, and 18 gauge wires. Yeah. Yeah. One more thing, and just I know they're changing over the uh, the Robo Rio possibly next next season. On the PDP, one thing that we did encounter uh, at a competition that uh, certainly the field tech reminded us of. Um, there's two levels of installation uh, for the 10 and the 20 amp mini fuse at the bottom of the power distribution board. Um, and it will sit into the housing and look like it's completely installed. Um, but it, and if you push incredibly hard, almost to the point of hurt, uh, hurting the end of your thumb, uh, it will drop down to a second loft level. And of course, on a lot of the games, like last year's games where you were driving off the ramp and a lot of shaking and uh, some bump and rumbling and stuff like that, uh, there were a number of power down issues. Uh, and if you lose that power, uh, it may not completely eliminate your robot, but you are going to kill the radio, which of course allows it to sit there and flash and not do anything. So yeah, just on the, um, yeah, you have that slide back up. There it goes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the yellow and the red fuses, they will sit into two different positions. There's mm -hmm. like an initial install and then there's a lock. and. Uh, it, we, you know, you unfortunately discovered the hard way when you lose power. So <laughs> these, the, so I, I do agree about that. I forgot about that totally. But uh, these little uh, white ones, these are I forget. I think they were called Wiedemuller connectors. Yeah. Um, yeah. To properly put those in, I, you, it's best to put ferro connectors. But when you have the can wire on the other one, it's better to strip the wire, put the can properly in, and push it. Don't push it all the way in, like shove it down, but strip it the right amount. I, I don't know what the exact amount is, but um, maybe like a centimeter and a half, strip that much, and then you shouldn't be able to see any of the wire once you properly put it in. Um, I would advise not using hot glue ever. I used hot glue this last year, and I found out that when I used the hot glue, one of the Wiedemuller connectors was pushed down, so the port was open. The hot glue was just holding the wire there. We bumped into someone, the wire came right out, and we never knew which one it was because we had hot glue over. So hot glue is not a great solution ever. Um, Do you find the handy tag help here? Uh, uh, not, not with this. Handy tag is only good when you have the old connection to the... <coughs> no, to the radio. Oh, yeah. Um, their sticky tack is only good if you use it on the battery terminals, uh, or you can wrap it with uh, electrical tape. Um, always, especially with this year's game, there was a lot of bumping and shoving and jumping off platforms, so the uh, main breaker always got loose. You, if you put putty on that or, elect or sticky tack, or always tighten it after every few matches, that's always a good idea. Um, yeah. You, so the PCM and the 
VRM are very, if you put ferrules in them, they get too close to each other and they don't fit in properly. So I, I, I really like putting wire straight into this. The ferrules, I only like using for the PDP. That's the only place they properly fit in. Um, How many kids would you have in your pit that are on the like sub-electrical team? So in 2056, we only had two people. Uh, that was depending on who was on the drive team. But now on 1241, 1285, we have more, more sub-teams. So there's a drive team, uh, an actual electrical sub-team, then there's a mechanical sub-team, and then there's a pit crew. So on the pit crew, you should always have at least one or two students, but on your sub-team, maybe three to four, just so they can plan it in CAD. Um, if you notice some of these pictures, they're all uh, images of CAD renderings of the electrical component. So you can actually put all of these systems into CAD. Um, another thing on 2056 we did was on our base plate, we put holes in them to mount where each system would go so we can put a screw right through it. And so the thing or the electrical component would never move. So do you put the electrical components on Lexan and then bolt the Lexan we, to your frame? How do you? On 2056, we had a very thin 1 16th sheet of metal and we put it onto that. On metal, right? Uh, it was Aluminum. Yeah, sheet metal, yeah. Is there a benefit between sheet metal versus that, that's ha so, on a, so every team has a different thing. Uh, 1241, we have, our, most of our robots made out of tubing. On 2056, most of our robots made out of sheet metal where we can bend it, which is lighter. So we could afford to put uh, a thin piece of Lexan or thin piece of metal. But depending on your weight, there's no advantage to putting either one. But the advantage is to putting, making holes either for zip ties or screws to your electrical components never move. Especially your compressor, because of the amount of vibration it creates, it will shift very easily. But yeah, there's no benefit to using sheet metal over Lexan, but it's better to have it secure on those places, either through Velcro screws or zip ties. Um, one more thing. I don't know how many people had battery cable issues this year because uh, of all the shaking and stuff like that, but uh, your pit crew at competition uh, should be checking each one of the battery terminals and if they're not using star washers or additional uh, lock washers on your battery cable ends, um, you should think of investing in a package of small lock washers because um, in helping out a number of teams uh, at competitions, uh, we found more of the um, little packages of uh, fasteners that they give you with the new battery. Um, we're, we're backing off and loosening off because they don't actually come with a lock nut. They're only coming with a, a standard nut and a small lock washer that um, strip out very easily. So. I'm done.